from Maryland, correct? Excellent. Well, my name is Maria Garnett. I am your neighbor to the south. I live in Richmond, Virginia. Um, this is my third year um, being involved with We the People. I love getting to spend time with students just like yourselves. Um, I am a public policy professional. In my current role, I am a policy advisor for the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services. So it's great to be with you all today. Um, Dan, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Wong. I'm a retired uh, attorney and former judge. I'm on a, also on the National Board of Directors for the Center for Civic Education, and I live in Boise, Idaho. Glad to see you all. So go ahead and please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hi, my name is Bella Fiery, and I'm a senior at Boonsboro High School. After graduating, I plan on attending the University of Maryland, focusing on an English second language education. Hello, my name is Lindsay Sparkman. I'm a senior at Binsborough High School. And after graduating high school, I plan on attending the University of Maryland and studying environmental science and policy. Hi, my name is Will Green and I'm a senior at Boonsboro High School. Uh, after graduation, I plan on attending a Hagerstown Community College and then transferring to East Carolina University. And this is our teacher, Ms. Fasik. Good morning. Good morning. Great, thank you. So. I am going to dive right in with your unit six question. Thomas Hobbes noted that life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. How has the human condition changed over time? And how is that change reflected in our expectations of government? Should the principles of natural rights or classical republicanism guide policy changes de designed to improve the condition of all people? And what are the most pressing domestic and global challenges facing Americans today and in the future? What policies can you suggest to address them? You may begin. In modern times, American ideals have shifted. The human condition has evolved and reformed as society learns from our past mistakes. Due to the 19th and 13th Amendment, women and minorities have opportunities that would not have been plausible when America was first founded. Over time, expectations of government have morphed to encapsulate a government that stands for all citizens, not a subsection of those, of those citizens. This expectation of inclusion can be seen today within our government, such as Biden's cabinet pick Rachel Levine, the first transgender woman picked as assistant health secretary. And Kamala Harris, the first woman vice president. As our society has grown, the people have begun to demand that the government reflect on and take actions and not regress. Mike, Mike, can we pause it for a brief second? Oh. I have. You did, okay. Um, Bella, your um, sound and video kind of cut out and froze there, so um, if, if everybody who is not speaking um, wants to turn their video off to preserve bandwidth, and then um, please start again with that sentence that you were saying. But, oh, oh there you are, okay. This expectation of, of inclusion can be seen today within our government, such as Biden's cabinet pick for Rachel Levine, the first transgender woman picked as assistant health secretary. And Kamala Harris, the first woman vice president. As our society has grown, the people have begun to demand that the government reflect on past injustices and take action so that the quality of life may not regress. Americans expect our government to create laws focused on inclusion. So far, the demand for action has been acknowledged by President Biden with an abundance of executive orders to promote racial equality and prevent discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. As societal and political institutions continue to adapt, the government should create policies that will assist in improving the quality of life for all people. While it is clear that the philosophies of natural rights and classical republicanism have guided the formation and development of our government, the principles of the latter should be the focus of policy changes designed to improve the conditions of people in society. The theory of natural rights, which was crucial to the formation of American democracy, posits that each individual is entitled to certain unalienable rights, which John Locke identified as life, liberty, and property. Natural rights philosophy is used to guide the formation of domestic policies. The individual rights of the people will be protected and not infringed upon by the government. 
However, the principle of natural rights focuses too heavily on the power of the individual. Classical republicanism emphasizes the common good, which allows the individual to focus on their duty and role as a citizen in society. The theory of common good states that focusing on the self is not cohesive with the benefits of the community, and improving the situation for the majority of society will be the most advantageous for the most people. While human nature may be to focus on the self, a developed democracy has a responsibility to counter the selfishness and provide policies that will benefit all members of society. Both political leaders and developed democracies also have the responsibility to uphold civic virtue and promote policy that benefits their constituents and not themselves. A government can use classical republicanism, specifically common good, to guide policy by developing programs to improve living conditions for the public, such as creating infrastructure like roads and telecommunication systems and Im implementing social welfare programs. The government should also allow the public to involve themselves in the formation of policy in order to uphold the social contract. This system for developing uh, policy directly coincides with the ideas of classical republicanism as it requires the involvement of the public public and political affairs in the notion of common interest. America has faced many problems throughout its history, civil war, discrimination, and now COVID-19. The coronavirus has now spread globally and impacted life throughout the past year. America has embraced curfews, masks, social distancing, and self-quarantining as solutions for the pandemic. A new vaccine has been created and now distributed throughout America to slow the spread of the virus. However, these restrictions have caused society to become divided. Some believe their natural rights are being taken while others believe this is the best course of action. Closely related to the idea of natural rights during the pandemic is the issue of free speech and civil discourse. Some argue that speaking in opposite views, such as protesting COVID restrictions, can cause violence to occur between individuals with differing viewpoints. Another issue is pollution and climate change, caused by carbon emissions that are harming the environment. To combat this, car companies are transitioning into using electric cars and other industries are working to create greener forms of energy. Countries across the world have been making changes to lower emissions, such as agreements like the Paris Accords. The world's problems have solutions, and we are working to implement those solutions. Thank you for listening to our testimony. We're now ready for your questions. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, so throughout your opening statement, you made references to the government, but you only sometimes clarified which level of government you were talking about, like with references to the current presidential administration. Um, so which level of government federal, state, local, do you think is best equipped to help promote um, improvements to people's conditions um, based on the principles of classical republicanism and why? I think that from a, at a state level, I think that state governments have a lot of responsibility and power there because classical republicanism also encapsulates the idea of, you know, small communities being the most um, well formed to promoting the social welfare for the most people, because if you have a small community, or in this case, a state where there's a shared um, interest, shared beliefs, and more cohesiveness than at a national level, you have more of a way to, you know, represent people's interest and make sure that people, um, their quality of life is promoted. And to do that at a state level is easier because there would be more agreement and more cohesiveness among um, the people within the state rather than focusing on, you know, putting that at a national level where it would be more complicated and it would be harder for states to agree on what the best course of action would be. And while I agree that the state level may be the best um, opportunity in order to really focus on the common good, someone on the, on the offside could argue that the federal level may be better because depending on what state you live in, different ideals may be focused on depending on the area or the region of the state. But if something is focused on federally, then it doesn't really matter the ideologies that vary between the states because it's federal. So therefore it applies to all the states. And when we vote in the president, he is supposed to uphold the common good. So therefore he can extend down his power down to the states to make sure that everyone is represented and there is equality. If I heard correctly, I believe you testified that uh, government should have policies that improve the quality of life for all and that will benefit all. Um, some cynics would say that's impossible to benefit all, improve the quality of life for all. So what, 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 what do you say to those where government institutes a policy that benefits most, but not all? What do you say to those people who aren't benefited? and whose quality of life isn't increased.
So what I'm saying, what I'm asking is the, the minority, the, the, you know, how do you benefit the, the minority that's, that's not, uh, be, that, that doesn't receive the benefits of a policy designed to benefit all, but doesn't benefit a minority? Any ideas? I would say the best thing that you can do, and especially what I've seen mostly in modern society is continue to protest and advocate for yourselves. Because I think now with the media, with protesting, that'll gain the most coverage. And if the federal government can see that people are truly interested in advocating for groups that often have been unheard, most likely policy changes will occur because they see this domino effect of everyone coming together and everyone advocating for those people. Going off of what my colleague said, um, uh, with the protests, uh, uh, federal governments could write legislature that could specifically help those minorities that aren't being helped, uh, which could bring, uh, which could uh, help them improve their quality of life while also having the other uh, policies that help everyone else, so everyone else can be helped. You you talked throughout your testimony and even so far in your responses um, about this theory of the common good. And I'm just curious, you know, what in the Constitution itself, whether the main body of the Constitution or um, the amendments that have been made to the Constitution, best supports that idea <clears throat> that government does have a responsibility to promote the common good? Well, wow. that, go ahead. Um, I would say that the Bill of Rights in particular, while it is clearly a representation of the idea of natural rights, I think that you can derive um, classical republicanism and common good ideals from that by saying that if people in society have their natural rights, um, in the society is inherently working to promote common good for those people. And by people understanding what their rights are and, and that the government can't take those rights away from you, as an individual, I think that you have a better concept of um, yourself and also your community and making sure that people have access to those rights and therefore you work to promote the common good by upholding those rights for individuals, especially for people that, um, you, that aren't you, because the idea of common good is making policy that benefits not just yourself, but people around you and thinking about how um, your choices in government affect other people and not just yourself. So understanding rights and the, specifically the rights outlined in the Bill of Rights is very important to the idea of common good. Going off of what my colleagues said also, we briefly mentioned that in our statement, the 19th and the 13th Amendment, that can be applied to the common good because before those amendments were passed and were implemented throughout society, it wasn't, it, you couldn't argue that it was the common good because not everyone was being represented and not everyone was being seen as an equal member within society. But once those amendments were passed and implemented, you started to see other groups come together and form to create a whole society and not a subsection of that society. So in your testimony, you've talked about um, <clears throat> appropriate uh, federal policies and appropriate state policies. Let's even go lower than that. Talk about, if you can, about local policies like city or county. Uh, what city or uh, county uh, policies can be implemented that will help the most people? And what issues should they be addressing at the local level? Because I, I've heard that politics are always local. Have any ideas? Uh, local. Uh... Local governments have the most insight into that area and uh, region, so they can give they can uh, write the best policies uh, to help promote uh, the whole community. The whole community because they are there and they're seeing it, compared to someone at the state or uh, federal uh, level who could be uh, miles away and not there seeing it, seeing what's affecting the town or community. So I believe that local government can write the best policy for uh, advocating for uh, town's issues. Yeah, but what 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 issues? What local town issues should, uh, would they should they address? I think specifically um, local governments could 
you know, create infrastructure programs, like if they want to improve the community and make the city a better place, they might, you know, build more parks or more um, social places where people can gather and um, like community centers, um, specifically aimed at, you know, bringing the community together and getting um, input mm -hmm. from certain groups about, you know, what changes they would like to see and how to improve their community. So I think it's more focused on, you know, the social aspect and how the city is formed to um, improve the conditions of the people within. Right. That is time. Thank all you. right. Yeah. Thank you all <clears throat> so much. Dan and I are going to give you some feedback now on how you did. Um, you know, you all responded really well to questions that, you know, maybe you weren't anticipating or, may, or maybe might have seemed kind of like curveball questions. And I, I really appreciated that even, even when you, you know, were pausing and thinking about a question, you didn't give up. You know, you, you really worked to um, do your best to answer those questions. And I think that you all, you know, supported one another and built off of one another in a really compelling way. Um, so just know that I very much noticed that. Um, some constructive feedback that I have for you. Um, one, in person, this is not as big of a deal because everybody's just looking at everybody, but virtually the constant changing back between people on your team was actually a little bit difficult to follow. Um, and, it, and I think it kind of ate into the time that you had. So instead of one person getting to continue an argument, you know, there were more little pauses as one person stopped and the other one started. So, so maybe think about that going forward. Um, and then the other piece of feedback that I have is, you know, in my question about how does the constitution support this argument that you've been making the whole time, you know, there are lots of phrases in the very preamble to the constitution about promoting the general welfare, for example, to form a more perfect union, you know, so always think about, you know, what is the main purpose of this thing that I'm doing and, and what are the most compelling sources of evidence, including the text of the Constitution itself that you can use to support your arguments. Um, so again, great job. This has been a really weird and difficult year for everybody. Um, and I hope that you all feel great about what you've done today. I, I too uh, appreciated your, your testimony. I mean, it took a little while to get there to talk about local issues, but, but you got there. Infrastructure, parks, community centers. Um, uh, what I was thinking as far as uh, infrastructure was traffic. Uh, that's a big local issue. Uh, zoning, uh, parks, absolutely. Uh, you know, here in the Boise area, the, the residents are very big on parks. And so that's a, definitely a, a local issue. And so you got there, it took a little while, but you got there. And then there are policies uh, that are best addressed at the local level. There are policies best addressed at the state level and there's policies best addressed at the federal level. And, and uh, you, you, you obviously recognize that. Um, I, I did enjoy your, your presentation. Uh, uh, feedback for improvement, I would ask you to slow down a bit. I mean, I, I recognize that uh, you're all excited, et cetera, but slowing down and, and speaking a little more clearly and distinctly is, is helpful, especially in, in this uh, format. But overall, uh, good job. Thank you very much. Sorry, my bad. All right, so that concludes this. Thank you for your participation and good luck for the rest of your afternoon.